Uh, good afternoon. Uh, the first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions, and in order to get as many people in as possible, I prefer short and succinct questions and answers. Uh, question one, Graham Day doesn't appear to be here, so we'll move straight on to question two, Colin Keir. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the youth employment trends are in the Edinburgh Western constituency. Mr Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Office for National Statistics advised that the sample size in the annual population survey for the last two years is too small to obtain a statistically reliable indication of recent youth unemployment trends in the Edinburgh Western constituency. However, what I can say to the member is that youth unemployment in Scotland is at the lowest rate for five years, and in comparison with the UK, we have a higher youth employment rate and a lower youth inactivity rate. And here. Would the Minister agree that investment in young people programmes such as Learning for Life run by Diageo in my constituency are vital if we are to maintain a professional level of competence and drive in all sectors of the economy? Minister. Um, I would indeed agree that investing in our young workforce is essential for sustainable economic growth across all sectors of the economy. I am quite clear too that employers have a crucial role to play in the employment and development of young people. And Diageo, I would say, is a shining example of a business which recognises that tapping into the talents of a young and diverse workforce is not just the right thing to do, but makes economic sense for employers and for Scotland. I would also add that Diageo's commitment to youth employment has recently been recognised through the uh, company being amongst the first in Scotland to gain the new Investors in Young People Award, an accolade which the Scottish Government is supporting for businesses with a strong track record of recruiting and developing Scotland's young women and men. Rolling out such an accolade to recognise firms that have taken a particular interest in supporting our young people was indeed a key recommendation from the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce. Investors in Young People is available only in Scotland and is another demonstration of how the Scottish Government and Scottish employers are committed to supporting our young men and women into employment and growing their talent. Many thanks. Question three, Hans Alan Malik. Thank you and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to ensure that all workers in the education sector are being paid at least the living wage. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. As uh, um, the member will know, we are the first and only government in the UK to commit to paying the living wage to employees covered by our pay policy uh, and to those in the NHS. However, the Scottish Government is not able to set pay levels in the private sector or indeed the wider public sector. Pay for higher and further educational and local government employees is a matter for employers and their trade unions. Uh, that said, uh, as the member also knows, we strongly encourage all organisations to follow our example. Thank you. Hans Ala Malik. I thank you very much for that response. I welcome the recent announcement of the agreement reached ensuring that all cleaners at the Scottish Government locations would be paid a living wage However, this agreement only relates to staff directly employed by the Scottish Government. My colleague James Kelly last week uh, highlighted that a company called Mighty um, employed cleaners in Annie's Den College who were indirectly paid by the Scottish Government were not being paid the living wage. Will the Cabinet Secretary give me an assurance that all companies bidding for or renewing contracts from the Scottish Government would be required to pay at least a living wage to all the employees in the future? Well, as I just indicated, we are not able to set a pay policy uh, for other than our own direct employees. And those who are uh, contracted within the uh, uh, wider public sector, uh, those conversations would need to be had with the individual organisations, for example, the colleges, uh, and directly with their contractors. We will, however, of course, I think as the member is probably also aware, uh, be publishing statutory guidance to the wider public sector. Uh, and uh, uh, I, uh, that should be uh, uh, done uh, by the end of 2015. I very much hope uh, that people will take uh, notice of that. Um, it, it is really going to be for public bodies on how workforce related matters, including the living wage, may be taken into account in public procurement processes. But we simply don't have the power at the moment to mandate uh, what the member would like to see and indeed what I would like to see as well. 
Many thanks. Uh, John Mason. The Cabinet Secretary would agree with me that the real answer to Mr Malik's problem is if Scotland had control of the statutory minimum wage and then we could control pay policy throughout a society. Cabinet Secretary. Of course, uh, it is unfortunate that the uh, Smith Commission recommendations don't go as far uh, as we would like them to have done. If we'd had control uh, over the minimum wage, we could have uh, set policy in a much more direct fashion than we are currently able to do, and it would, help us, would have helped us with a slightly tricky issue uh, of the procurement issues in respect of the EU directives as well. Thank you very much. Question four, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it has given to youth employment training in the last year. Mr Annabel Ewing. Uh, the number of young people unemployed in Scotland is at its lowest level for five years, with Scotland outperforming the UK in both youth employment and on youth uh, inactivity rates. In each year of the current Parliament, this Government has asked Scot uh, Skills Development Scotland to deliver 25,000 modern apprenticeships, increasing year-on-year year to 30,000 by 2020. And we also have 17,150 pre-employment training places through the um, uh, Employability Fund. The majority of starts on both of these programmes continue to be firmly targeted at young people. In addition to this, presiding officer, we have established the Youth Employment Scotland Fund, supporting employers to recruit young people, and also Community Jobs Scotland, providing jobs training opportunities in a supportive third sector environment for young people. Interventions like these continue to enhance the skills of our young people and support transitions to further study, training and employment. Thank you very much. David Torrance. I thank the Minister for her response. According to the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation, 16.6 per cent of the population of my Kirkcaldy constituency are unemployment deprived, compared to 12.8 in Scotland as a whole. Can this Minister advise what additional support the Scottish Government makes available to young people living in deprived areas to help prepare them for employment? Minister. Um, opportunities for all is this government's explicit commitment to offer a place in learning or training to every 16 to 19 year old who is not currently in employment education or training. Through local youth employment activity plans, Skills Development Scotland uh, uh, is working with local partners across Fife and indeed across Scotland to ensure that training provision is closely aligned to the needs of young people in each local authority area across Scotland. In this way, we are ensuring access for all, regardless of social background. Uh, further, presiding officer, a refresh of the youth employment strategy will be published uh, this month and will focus on the long-term aim of implementing the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce recommendations. And in the context of improving labour market conditions, there will be a refocus uh, of current programmes to incentivise the recruitment of young people who face barriers. Uh, we will support small businesses to offer modern apprenticeship opportunities. And there will also be a focus on encouraging businesses to offer more higher level modern apprenticeships. A supplementary from Mary Scanlon. I ask the Minister why there are 30,000 16 to 19 year olds not in education, employment or training when there are so many strategies that she's now repeated three times today uh, on offer. Minister. Uh, I thank the, the member for a question. Obviously, there are a, a number of strategies because surely we are all determined to see our young people have opportunities in life. What we are seeing with the Modern Apprenticeship Programme is indeed uh, a meeting of our ambitious 25,000 year-on-year uh, target, which has been exceeded. Uh, uh, and we are also seeing an ambitious target of 30,000 Modern Apprenticeships by uh, 2020. Uh, it is also fair to reflect that the unemployment uh, uh, trend in Scotland is at its lowest level for five years and I think that uh, is uh, uh, evidence of the direction of travel that these policies are ensuring that we are going in Scotland. I think all of us have a duty to our young people uh, to do all that we can to maximise their opportunities and I would hope in my new portfolio presiding officer to work with people across the chamber to ensure that that objective is met. Thank you. Question five, Jane Baxter. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making with the implementation of the findings of the report of the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce. Cabinet Secretary. 
Since publication of the Commission's report in June, we've made considerable progress in taking forward its various recommendations. We've already deployed £5 million of £12 million allocated in 2014-15, with a further £16.6 .6 million set aside for this work in 2015-16. Uh, so our commitment to the young workforce is clear. Uh, obviously, I will be able to say a good deal more about how we will implement the Commission's recommendations next week uh, uh, during the debate in this chamber. Thank you very much. Jane Baxter. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The National Deaf Children's Society has highlighted the educational outcomes for deaf young people in Scotland and their opportunities to enter the workforce vary dramatically in comparison with their peers without additional support needs. As the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of tomorrow's members' debate on educational attainment and deaf children, could she also give, give, give a commitment to ensure that the specific needs of deaf young people are not forgotten as the Commission's findings are implemented? While I welcome the findings in the Commission's report to increase opportunities for young disabled people, could the Cabinet Secretary also give consideration to the recommendations put forward by NDCS to improve the educational, employment and training outcomes for deaf young people? Can I, can I thank the member for raising that issue in the chamber? Um, it is important for us to remember uh, that there's a great uh, many uh, needs in terms of access right across our society. Um, I was discussing some of them at the National Economic Forum uh, this morning, uh, and indeed the issue of uh, disabled access to employment was uh, part of that conversation. I can reassure the member uh, that we are taking on board all of those issues, and not only will it be a matter for uh, the issues around the youth, the young workforce, but we will also be looking at it in terms of the Fair Work uh, uh, programme, which I'm also taking forward on roughly the same timescale. Uh, so the member may be pleased when she uh, hears further information about that, uh, because that is very much part and parcel of what we want to ensure, uh, that everybody, regardless of uh, their background and regardless of their ability, uh, is able to get some access to employment uh, and to make that employment the best it possibly can be. Amy McGregor, briefly. Uh, thank you. Recommendation 15 of the Commission says that businesses across Scotland should be encouraged and supported to enter into three- to five-year partnerships with secondary schools and that every secondary school in Scotland and its feeder primaries should be supported by at least one business in a long-term partnership. Does the Minister agree this partnership approach is potentially very important to increase school pupils' understanding of local businesses in their area, and what specific support is the government providing to ensure that this recommendation is implemented across Scotland? Well, as a member knows, uh, we are talking about a seven-year programme uh, across uh, um, uh, the, the sectors. Early action uh, is clearly needed to assess the cost of full implementation over that whole uh, seven years. However, we are confident that the £28.6 million allocated over this year and next will address costs in the early stages. Uh, the Commission itself recommended that uh, the uh, recommendations would be out through mainstream funding. They weren't looking for uh, additional special funding. Uh, so the issue that he uh, raises is important uh, and we are aware of the need to make sure that the partnerships do develop uh, as well as they possibly can. This will not work without partnership development and the partnerships are not just what he's talking about but go much more uh, widely uh, than that. Uh, but we, uh, uh, we are absolutely uh, clear that without schools' involvement, without the involvement of the education sector, uh, um, then it uh, uh, will not succeed. And that is why we are putting a very strong focus on that. Uh, and it will be very much part and parcel of what we will be discussing next week in the Chamber. Many thanks. Question six, John McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has devolved a recruitment incentive package to equip and support smaller and micro-businesses to recruit and train more young people. Minister Annabel Ewing. Uh, in response to the economic downturn which followed the 2008 global financial crisis, the Scottish Government acted quickly in partnership with local authorities to establish the Youth Employment Scotland Fund. This fund offers recruitment incentives to help micro, small and medium-sized businesses employ young people. Given the improving labour market conditions, we will be reviewing uh, that fund and other recruitment incentives. This review will form part of our refresh of the youth employment strategy and will be in the context of our work to implement the recommendations of the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforces report, Education Working for All. 
Uh, I look forward to hearing contributions from members during the debate on our implementation plan, which, as the Cabinet Secretary has indicated, is to take place next week. John McAlpine. I thank the Minister for that answer. Great progress has been made in Dumfries and Galloway on modern apprenticeships, with numbers doubling uh, since 2007. And as she said herself, um, there will be further benefits when the Wood report recommendations are implemented, in particular to give more help to micro-businesses which uh, dominate in the region. Can the Cabinet Secretary or Minister outline how this will be rolled out across the country? Um, I, I thank the member for her, her interest in the subject and I am delighted in the increase in modern apprenticeship starts across Dumfries and Galloway since 2007 and we will of course look to build on this uh, with the wider expansion of the modern apprenticeship programme as we work towards, as I said, our new ambitious target of 30,000 uh, new opportunities each year by 2020. Uh, through the development of skills investment plans and wider industry engagement, we are identifying opportunities to promote the benefits of apprenticeships to businesses big and small across Scotland. As recommended by the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce, we are working to better understand the barriers uh, faced by small and medium-sized enterprises in taking on modern apprentices, and we will look to develop appropriate support to help these businesses across Scotland. Uh, details, again, of our plans will be included in the implementation plan, which we will look forward to debating, presiding officer, next week. Excellent. Question seven, Drew Smith. Thank you very much, presiding officer. May I ask the Scottish Government whether it will support devolving to local authorities delivery of the work currently carried out under the Department of Working Pensions Work Programme? Well, the Government does agree that the partnership is crucial to the current delivery of employability services in Scotland, and that's a commitment that was clearly set out in our 2012 employability framework, working for growth uh, and continuing through the Scottish Employability Forum. Partnership will therefore also be key to the successful delivery of any new employment programmes in Scotland. We recognise the need for and value of locally tailored services to meet the needs of individuals and, labour, uh, and local labour markets, and we think we can do that best in concert with the third sector and local authority employability schemes that we have in Scotland. Right, can very I thank the Bruce Cabinet Bruce. Secretary very much for that answer, President Officer. Glasgow is the powerhouse of the Scottish economy and with the ability to tailor support uh, for job seekers which reflects the reality of local labour markets around the country, we do have a real opportunity to improve the successor arrangements for the work, work programme. Would the Minister agree, or the Cabinet Secretary rather, agree to meet with Glasgow City Council in early course uh, to discuss the evolution of the work programme and will she give uh, further consideration to how the work of Skills Development Scotland could also be better aligned to take into account uh, local need and indeed local opportunity? Since the Smith Commission report was published, I think it's fair to say that the SCVO, Skills Development Scotland and COSLA have all uh, expressed a view that they would be able to run the new employment programmes emanating from the agreed devolution. But of course, we haven't actually got that devolution yet. Uh, so we're still in the process of uh, trying to establish uh, uh, when that will uh, come to us. I, I am happy, however, to commit uh, to meeting uh, whichever organisation uh, members wish me to, to discuss all of the issues that are within this particular uh, area of my portfolio responsibility. And in any case, I would have expected to meet uh, an organisation as large as Glasgow Council uh, in the normal course of events. So uh, I can promise the member uh, that that conversation will take place. Thank you. Question eight, Bob Doris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what engagement it's had with the UK Government regarding the extension of the Department of Work and Pensions work programme. Secretary Rosanna Cunning. Uh, last uh, week, uh, Presiding Officer, uh, I wrote to Ian Duncan Smith, Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, to note that the decision of UK ministers to extend the work programme contract without reference to the Scottish Government was incompatible with the terms of the Smith Commission agreement on the devolution of contracted DWP programmes. Uh, on 3rd December, Ian Duncan Smith responded to me to indicate that ministers had made the decision in August and would not change that decision. Many thanks. Bob uh, Doris. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Um, I agree with the SCVO who says the extension has caused a delay in ridding Scotland of this exploitative, punitive and underperforming programme. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that when Scotland designs our own employability programmes, such as Community Jobs Scotland, which costs just £35 million and is approaching its 5,000th successful job, that would meet the needs of unemployment and training needs far better than the UK Government, and that the UK's decision should be reversed and the work programme passed to Scotland as a matter of urgency? Cabinet Secretary. I would agree with the member. Um, I think 
uh, Drew Smith might also be interested in this aspect of uh, uh, the discussion this afternoon. I can assure Bob Doris that our ambitions in delivering employment services through the devolved powers outlined by S Smith certainly exceed the success the work programme has so far achieved in Scotland, which by uh, our assessment is nowhere near good enough. In designing employability services, we can continue to draw on the strengths of a range of partners. I've already mentioned them, Skills Development Scotland, local authorities, the third sector, and build on their current successful delivery across a range of initiatives. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to providing the best possible support for the unemployed, but we don't believe we can do that unless we have uh, the ability to actually make the changes that we consider to be necessary. And right now, it doesn't look like we're going to have the, that ability anywhere in the near future. Many thanks. And we now move to portfolio questions on social justice, communities and pensioners' rights. Question one, Murdo Fraser. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to encourage more new homes to be built in town centre locations. Minister Margaret Burgess. The Scottish Government's town centre action plan is clear in our commitment to set town centre living. We launched a £2.75 million town centre housing fund to bring, about, to bring more empty home town empty town centre properties back into residential use, and this will secure 82 units for affordable housing. Complementing this, new guidance published in August 2014 encourages local authorities to fully consider the role that town centres can play as residential communities when drawing up their local housing strategies. Thank you. Mardu Fraser. Can I thank the uh, Minister for her response? I'm sure she'll be aware with the changing nature of retail. We're seeing more and more uh, disused shops in secondary trading uh, situations. What more can be done to encourage these disused shops to be converted into residential properties? And what more can be done to encourage empty spaces above shops in town centre locations to be also be converted? And what specific encouragement will the Scottish Government give to local authorities to be more flexible in relation to their approach in terms of planning to applications for this to be done? Minister. Um, we have certainly given guidance to local authorities in terms of the town centre first uh, principle and also it is not just the town centre um, housing fund we have, we also have the empty homes uh, fund which is encouraging town centre properties uh, to be brought back into use and I certainly have visited some of those recently. Um, we are re-looking at our empty homes a loan fund and trying to align lining it better with our town centre fund to make the best use of those funds. But that is certainly one of the areas we're looking at is premises above um, shops or retail premises and also retail premises that are no longer in use or will no longer be in use for retail purposes. Many thanks. Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Minister tell me how many um, affordable homes were built as a result of the, the investment in the um, Town Centre Housing Fund and what the current status of the fund is? Minister. The, the Town Centre Housing Fund, I, I mentioned in my initial answer, we have um, has been 82 properties from that fund. But in terms of the Empty Homes Fund, we have brought uh, 76 properties back into use in the first year, 278 properties back into use the following year, and this year we have already exceeded that 278 properties. So that is in Empty Homes, some in Town Centre, some in not. But in the Town Centre um, Fund, it has been all used up and we intend to be 82 homes brought into use. Many thanks. Question two, Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the local data company's recent report on empty shop numbers. Thank you. Minister Marco Biaggi. Uh, I welcome recent findings from the local data company report that the retail vacancy rate in Scotland has fallen from 14.5% in 2013 to 13.7% this year. This statistic does not reflect local variation, but it does suggest that overall the Town Centre Action Plan may already be having a positive impact. The Town Centre Action Plan, one year on report, published on 4 November, provides a progress update of activity that is underway and highlights the measures designed to help our town centres to diversify, including the adoption of the Town Centre First Principle, the promotion of the Business Improvement District model, and through related initiatives such as the Can Do Towns Challenge. 
Roderick Campbell. I thank the Minister for that answer. He, he will be aware that Anstruther in my constituency was highlighted as one of the most improved towns and it was also found to have the highest proportion of independent shops. Does he believe that that is a factor in the reduction of shop vacancies and what additional support can the government offer to independent business start-ups? Minister. Anstruther is very well noted for its independent shops, including, if I may say so myself, the kind of independent shop fish and chips that put uh, food on my table quite literally as I was growing up. I would congratulate all involved in making the place a success. The Town Centre Action Plan recognises the value of healthy small businesses, and I would highlight the support that we are giving through the most generous package of support for small business anywhere in the UK, which totals £594 million through the Small business bonus, which helps uh, businesses that have sole property or, or just a, a small number, Fresh Start Relief, Business Gateway, and of course the enterprise agencies. I'd also point to the Community Empowerment Bill, which is going through, which will allow local authorities to launch targeted business rate schemes of their own, which they may well wish to focus on town centres. Many thanks. Question three, Sarah Boyack. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the impact of an ageing population on pensioners' rights. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Before I answer the question, can I wish Ms Boyack all the best in the leadership election for the Labour Party? Had I a vote, Presiding Officer, I would have voted for Ms Boyack. The, the Scottish Government routinely uses emerging evidence on demographic change in its policy development process. As a consequence, we have undertaken a range of actions to support pensioners' rights. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply and say that, sadly, the ballot is now closed, so he can no longer join us and give me that vote. Um, with the proportion of the population of pensionable age projected to increase in the coming decades, um, I think we're all interested to know more about the impact this will have on the Scottish Government's responsibility for public sector pensions. I note from this year's budget that the overall funding for the Scottish Public Pension Agency is set to increase by over 40% in real terms, including a more than 50% increase in funding for the NHS superannuation scheme. Can the Cabinet Secretary clarify the reason behind the significant increase and provide assurances that funding for public sector pension schemes is sustainable in the long term? Alec Neil. The presiding officer, can I first just emphasise the point that Sarah Boyack makes about the ageing of the population. If you look at the figures, over the next 20 years, the number of 75-year-olds is going to increase very significantly. And uh, In fact, the Registrar General estimates that one-fifth of all the babies born in Scotland today will live until they're 100 years of age. So this is a permanent feature of our society, not a short-term phenomenon. Uh, in relation to public sector pensions, as the member will know, over the last two or three years, we've been in detailed discussions with the Treasury because the UK government has taken, for most of these pensions, they have responsibility for deciding both the employer's contribution and the employee's contribution. And the member will know that employee's contributions have been rising in recent years, even at a time of pay restraint, which we have opposed. And that's one of the reasons why the funding situation has uh, changed. And, uh, of course, they're now increasing the employer's contribution, which is one of the major reasons why we've got such pressure, for example, on our health budget. Many thanks. Question four, Angus MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what benefit it expects the additional £10 million has been invested in funding and empowering communities to bring. Sir Marco Biaggi. The Scottish Government expects this additional funding to bring huge benefits to communities right across Scotland, especially those suffering disadvantage. The precise benefits will be determined by communities themselves. They are best placed to know what challenges and opportunities to focus on in order to deliver more prosperity and fairness. Thank you. Angus MacDonald. Clearly, the new £10 million community empowerment fund is very welcome, and I will certainly be encouraging communities in my Falkirk East constituency to take advantage of it. For communities to be engaged, however, they require local bodies such as community councils to be active. However, as the Minister will be aware, there are some areas of Scotland without community councils. What can the Scottish Government do to encourage participation and ensure every square mile of Scotland is represented by a local community council? Minister. Uh, well, local authorities have the statutory oversight of community councils and are required to set up schemes for their area, but we are working in collaboration with COSLA and in the Improvement Service and have been since 2013 to roll out support with the first website to raise public awareness, provide resources, 
and also uh, to work through the network of community council liaison officers. This government, however, takes community empowerment very, very seriously, and it must go from the ground up. The Community Empowerment Bill recognises the importance of bodies uh, such as community councils, confers extra powers on them, and I know from some of my uh, visits already that where community councils uh, set up community development trusts, there is often uh, a great uh, demonstration of what community councils can do. There is nothing better for community empowerment than leadership by example. Thanks. Question five, Christina McKelvey. Right, thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it will ensure that the high level of democratic participation seen in the referendum continues. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. The Scottish, the Scottish Government has a strong record of public engagement demonstrated through a programme of cabinet meetings in venues across the length and breadth of Scotland, an extensive series of public town hall meetings and regular engagement with stakeholders. We want to continue that conversation with the people of Scotland and be a government defined by its openness and accessibility. Um, in the summer of, of last year, we launched a consultation exercise to seek views on how we can improve the quality of democracy in Scotland by encouraging wider engagement and participation in elections. Our programme for government, published in November, sets out our commitment to strengthen how we engage and involve people and communities in decision-making so that they get the opportunity to argue for the outcomes that they want. In doing so, we will use the lessons learned in the referendum to ensure that the incredible participation and engagement levels we all witnessed are harnessed and maintained. Many thanks. Uh, Christina McKelvey. Thank the Minister uh, for that answer. And, and he will you know, be just as aware as me of the uh, democratic participation participation that took place from the, the very youngest um, in, in our society to, to the, the more mature, shall I say. The Minister will be, like me, delighted that the Labour Party this week are now supporting Votes for 16 and making that call. But given that all parties across this chamber in a recent debate led by myself supported Votes at 16, does the Minister agree with me that rather than wait for Smith the powers over the franchise should be transferred to the Scottish Parliament as quickly as possible to ensure that 16-year-olds can vote in the 2016 election. Minister. Thank the member for the question. The short answer to that question is yes. Um, the need for that to happen was recognised by, by the Smith Commission. The Commission recommended that the Scottish Parliament should have all powers in relation to Scottish Parliament and local government elections in Scotland. Lord Smith specifically called on the UK Parliament to devolve the relevant powers in sufficient time to allow the Scottish Parliament to extend the franchise to 16 and 17 year olds for the 2016 election. And the First Minister has emphasised the need to make rapid progress on this, including in a letter on the 26th of November to the Prime Minister and when she recently met with the Secretary of State for Scotland on the 4th of December. Many thanks. Question six, Paul Martin. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Communities and Pensioners' Rights last met with Glasgow City Council and what matters were discussed. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presenting officer, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting representatives of Glasgow City Council since, since assuming my current ministerial responsibilities. Well, Martin. Uh, Presenting officer, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would join with me with, uh, in congratulating Glasgow City Council uh, on their affordable warmth dividend uh, paid to over 80s, uh, but obviously to ensure that that can continue and that good work in tackling fuel poverty directly can continue. Will he ensure that Glasgow receives a fair settlement in respect to the local government statement that we'll hear later today? Alec Neil. Officer, the local government finance settlement remains the responsibility of my colleague, the Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Finance, John Swinney, and it would be entirely wrong of me to preempt a statement he's about to make to Parliament. Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware that deaf-blind people in Glasgow have to contribute up to £168 per week to Glasgow City Council for a guide communicator, whereas deaf people can access British Sign Language interpreter free at the point of use? And can the Cabinet Secretary confirm where other local authorities provide free guide communicators to deaf-blind people? And does he agree that charging for guide communicators risks depriving deaf-blind people of essential support, which can affect not just their quality of life, but their ability to do what the rest of us take for granted. Alec Neil. 
presiding officer, I've got a lot of sympathy with the points that Margaret Mitchell, I think, very fairly makes. And indeed, I think there's a wider issue in relation to the social care charge increases in Glasgow City Council in recent times. And uh, COSLA, uh, as you know, have very strict guidelines on how these care charges should be applied. And uh, clearly, there is an issue, I think, to be addressed in relation to Glasgow because some of the increases have been extremely steep. And of course, these are for the most vulnerable members of our community. So I've got a great deal of sympathy, but I, as the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, I don't have any powers myself uh, to intervene. Many thanks. Question seven, Dave Thompson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what specific anti-poverty measures it considers are needed to support people in the Highlands. Minister Margaret Burgess. The challenges of living in rural areas are well understood. Increasing travel and fuel costs and access to digital services can often have greater impact in rural areas like the Highlands and Islands. The measures needed to address these challenges are wide-ranging and there is no single solution. Our revised child poverty strategy for Scotland is a national approach to tackling poverty with the aim of improving outcomes for households across Scotland. It includes actions like investing over £300 million since 2009 and a further £94 million this year and next on measures to address fuel poverty and encouraging greater digital participation and the use of internet in rural areas. Thank you. Dave Thompson. I thank the Minister for her answer. In a parliamentary debate about just over 18 months ago, I raised the issue of higher electricity prices in the Highlands and Islands. And I would ask the Minister if she thinks that it is socially just that electricity consumers in the North pay more for their electricity than those in other parts of the land. Minister. I think the member raises an important issue there, and he will be aware that energy regulation and prices is a reserve matter. But as the Energy Minister Fergus Ewing said in Parliament last month, this government is concerned about the level of energy bills throughout the country, but especially in the north of Scotland. <coughs> Fergus Ewing has since raised the issue of high electricity bills in the north of Scotland with the Chief Executive of Ofgem directly and written to the Secretary of State for <coughs> Energy and Climate Change. He has highlighted our concerns about the impact of the current charging arrangements and the apparent slow pace of progress in terms of Ofgem's further investigation into the matter. And he will continue to press for a timely and effective resolution. Many thanks. Question 8, Richard Lack. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Communities and Pensioners' Rights last met North Lancashire Council. Mr. Marco Biaggi. Neither the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Communities and Pensioners' Rights nor myself have met representatives of North Lanarkshire Council since assuming our current ministerial responsibilities. I can thank the Minister for that Richard answer. Labour-controlled North Lanarkshire Council is still dragging its feet in settling staff equal pay claims. It continues to have meetings discussing this in private, not allowing opposition councillors to see paperwork before the meeting and gathers the paperwork back in after the meeting. In light of Labour's hypocrisy in repaying the living wage but failing to pay equal pay claims, what action can the Minister take to ensure that this Council stops dragging its feet? Minister? I am appalled at the level of reluctance, the dragging of feet that has been demonstrated and that I've observed around the country. It is unfair to women and it stands against all values of fairness to fight tooth and nail to avoid paying out. The Scottish Government's powers to intervene are uh, unfortunately uh, not present because of the close legal relationship between employer and employee. But I would repeat calls that this behaviour is unacceptable. The Equal Pay Act was passed in 1970 and there is no place for this historic wrong to be defended in court by the representatives of all people in their area, whatever gender they may be, for, uh, may be from. And so I do not think it should go unchallenged and I don't intend to let it do so. Many thanks. Question nine, Christian Allah. To ask the Scottish Government what the equality's impact will be in Scotland of the UK Government's decision not to honour the legal entitlement for paternity leave for fathers who are in receipt of job seekers' allowance and are in mandatory work in community placements. Secretary Alex Neil. 
Presenting officer, the Scottish Government believes that ideally all fathers, including those on out-of-work benefits, would be able to spend quality time with their new babies in their families. I would urge the Department of Work and Pensions to look at this again and consider whether it's in the best interest of children, as well as, as this UK Government policy threatens to be detrimental to low-income vulnerable families. Does the Cabinet Secretary uh, agree with me that this undermines the work being carried out by the Scottish Government across portfolios on the early years, which seeks to reduce poverty and equality? Presiding, Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, I absolutely agree with the member. As he knows, we have a range of initiatives, including uh, the extent to, to which we have expanded nursery entitlement, the Early Years Collaborative, the Early Years Change Fund, and a range of other initiatives. But uh, it ill behoves the UK Government to uh, impose this kind of restriction, particularly when they are preaching the values of family life at a time uh, of uh, need. So our view is that family life should be promoted and uh, protected at every opportunity, and fathers should have the maximum opportunity to look after their children at such a young age. So I would totally agree with the member. And I think from a humanitarian point of view that the UK Government should think again on this. Many thanks. And that concludes portfolio questions. And we now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 11830 in the name of Ruth Davidson on the Smith Commission. I'd invite members who wish to...